In this video, I'll challenge you to hear the difference between a mix with normal plugins and the exact same mix again using oversampled plugins. Which mix will you prefer? And do you think you've got what it takes to hear digital aliasing? My name is Daniel Jason Booth and I teach mixing, recording and other audio related topics. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Later, I'll focus on the key differences and explain why you might have preferred one mix more than the other. Let's get to the test. Both mixers used the exact same plugins and settings, with all third-party plugins hosted within DDMF's Meta plugin as VSTs. One mix is set to four times oversampling for each plugin chain. In the other version, I've simply turned the oversampling off. Where no VST plugin was available, I simply used Pro Tools native AAX format for both test subjects. Here we go with test number one. Listen closely and jot down your responses, which I'll get you to later post in the comments. Which mix do you think is oversampled, A or B? Okay, how did you go? Feel free to run the video back and listen through again as many times as you need to. Before I bias your opinion with talk about aliasing, let's have two more listening tests. Here's test number two. Which mix do you think is oversampled? Mix C or mix D? Her shape and size I don't need advice, no She paints up that face To make sure those blemishes hide Her shape and size I don't need advice, no She paints up that face To make sure those blemishes hide Now you may say, you know what, I can't hear a big difference here. And that's totally fine. In some respects, the differences are subtle. If I heard one mix without ever hearing the other, I'd probably say that they both sounded great, but for different reasons. Okay, here we go with the last test. Which mix is oversampled? Mix X or mix Y? Naturally, 
comment all your answers below when you think you've got it. In very simple terms, an alias happens when one frequency is incorrectly coded as another frequency. The highest frequency your system can record is determined by your session sampling rate. Commonly, these are 44.1 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz, and so on and so forth. A digital system needs just two sample points to reconstruct the highest frequency that the sampling rate can accurately represent. Let's say the system takes only 16 samples of your audio per second, or 16 hertz. That would obviously be a terrible system, but let's go with it for now. If you need at least two sample points to represent the highest frequency accurately, the highest frequency you could represent is 8 hertz. Therefore, the sampling rate divided by 2 calculates the highest frequency it can reproduce accurately. Forty four point one kilohertz will accurately reproduce up to twenty two thousand and fifty hertz. Forty eight kilohertz will accurately reproduce frequencies up to twenty four thousand hertz. We hear sound between twenty hertz and twenty kilohertz at birth, so even forty four point one kilohertz reproduces all the frequencies we could possibly need or want to hear. When plugin processing adds extra harmonic content, and those harmonics extend beyond the accuracy limits of our sampling rate, also known as the Nyquist limit, that harmonic content is misinterpreted. This Nyquist limit acts like a mirror and it starts reflecting higher frequencies back down the spectrum in a predictable way until they reach zero hertz and again start to reflect back up causing havoc on our audio. So if we look at sound represented in reference to a sample rate, where these vertical lines signify individual sampling points, then this waveform completes one cycle over the time of three samples. Three samples, as we discussed, is more than enough information to recreate this sound accurately because you'll remember we only need two samples to represent the highest frequency possible for our chosen sample rate. Speaking of which, this frequency is exactly two samples long. Now, it could perhaps be interpreted by the sampling rate at these points, resulting in no sound, which is fine, because if we were working at 44.1 kilohertz, this frequency would be 22,050 hertz, which we wouldn't hear anyway. If we were to, for example, offset that slightly, we get these points which provide the required information for the accurate reconstruction of this frequency. What if we get a frequency less than two samples long, as we have here? You can see it doesn't quite reach the two sample point length. What happens then? Well, if we map out the points, what we get is something that looks more like this which is several frequencies of different wavelengths, all of which bear little resemblance to the original audio. This doesn't look anything like that. As such, that is the reason why the higher frequency now incorrectly translates as a lower frequency or lower frequencies with longer waveforms, effectively reflecting them back down the spectrum into the audible range. What if we had more sample points? At two times oversampling, we have enough data to interpret this frequency accurately. At four times oversampling, it's a bit of overkill really, it's more than accurate. This is what happens when you oversample within a plugin, like the DDMF Meta plugin. And let's take it one step further with perhaps something you're more likely to see. This complex wave is a combination of several overlapping frequencies both higher and lower than the Nyquist limit. What we get are these points at the normal sampling rate, 
which perhaps would translate to something like this. Again, this bears little resemblance to this waveform. This reinterpreted waveform is constructed of lower frequencies, such as this one here, which lasts three samples. Now that may not seem like much, but three samples at 44.1 kilohertz or 44,100 divided by three equals 14,700 hertz, which is within the range of most adults. So imagine what could happen with frequencies even higher and how they would reflect down. The only way to really map out this complex waveform correctly is to four times oversample it within a plugin. Once oversampling works its magic, it applies a steep cutoff filter at 20 kHz. And this effectively averages out the waveform to adhere to the original sampling rate by ignoring frequencies that don't comply with it. All the frequencies we hear are represented accurately. And for the most part, the extra harmonics aren't mirrored back into the audible range because the waveform is calculated with more samples and then averaged out for the actual sampling rate. This is a simplification. However, oversampling two or four times is usually enough to improve the sound quality in most cases. Aliasing generally occurs with these types of plugins. Plugins modeling analog gear, compressors, limiters, gates, dynamic EQs, multiband compressors, some virtual instruments, saturators, and distortion. Limiters, distortion, and saturation plugins are among the worst offenders, especially when pushed too hard or overloaded. You might see people suggest plugins have a sweet spot. Quote unquote. This is mostly true, and people are referring to avoiding overexciting plug in harmonics to the point where aliasing becomes loud enough for us to hear. Overloading plugins or digitally clipping is a surefire way to induce audible aliasing. So, I recommend you oversample distortion and dynamics processing plugins, as I've already mentioned. The main limiting factor will be the processing power of your PC or Mac. I would also recommend underdriving some plugins and make up the difference at the output, as this can help to lower harmonics to a level where they're not going to reflect back down at a volume that is loud enough for us to hear the aliasing. How did you go? Comment your answers below. I can now reveal that the correct answers were. If you guessed all correctly, well done. In my opinion, the oversampled version has far more depth. I really felt like the vocal just has more space around it. The instruments surround it with clear dividing zones. The normal plug-in version feels somewhat flat and slightly forward, with everything sharing the limelight a little bit more. The vocal feels harsh and cloudy, my only explanation is that perhaps aliasing creates momentary harshness, adding more complexity to the signal than necessary. In some ways, the differences are subtle, though I was particularly impressed with how pure the lower tones were and how in tune the bass content felt in the oversampled version. The tom toms and bass parts felt much richer, deeper, and they decay more naturally. Whereas the normal version I felt lacked tone clarity and things like the tom-toms just seemed to cut off abruptly for no reason. 
Overall, even if you couldn't tell the difference and still picked out the oversampled mix, it's likely that it just felt more musical to you. Perhaps more analog sounding, I don't know. It certainly didn't feel as bright as the normal mix. Some of you may have gravitated towards the brighter mix for that very reason. But as I isolate some examples, you'll hear how much smoother the highs sound in the oversampled mix. Interestingly, RX reveals better high frequency extension in the oversampled mix without the hazy cloud of the normal mix and brittle digital sounding transients. Listen closely again. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for watching and happy mixing.